everybody, and welcome to our latest installment of our newest cup program, Screened Plays. We've done a few so far, but now we got a fun summer popcorny blockbuster one we're doing now. And we are doing one in honor of a few reasons. So first off, we're doing it in honor of some regional Canadian theater happening here. Drayton just finished their 2023 run of this particular piece, A Few Good Men. And it was directed by Sky Brandon. And of course, we've had the big kind of unfortunate summer flop of Tom Cruise's latest Mission Impossible movie that just came out. It didn't do quite as well as it should have, thanks to Barbie and Oppenheimer, two other very solid films as well. But we thought, hey, we got Tom Cruise back in the spotlight again. We got Drayton doing their production. It seems the optimum time to be discussing the 1992 screen adaptation of Aaron Sorkin's A Few Good Men, directed by Rob Reiner, starring Tom Cruise as Lieutenant Daniel Caffey, Jack Nicholson as Colonel Nathan R. Jessup, Demi Moore as Lieutenant Commander Joanne Galloway, and Kevin Bacon as Captain Jack Ross. And joining us on this adventure, we have someone who just finished his run in A Few Good Men in Drayton. It is the wonderful George Alvizos, who appeared in one of our previous interview episodes. Hello, George. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Ooh. welcome. Welcome, welcome. You just finished playing lawyer number one and also reporter and also the court reporter. Yep. So welcome. Tell us, how was that for you? have now played these roles twice in the two separate Drayton runs in 2020 as well as 2023. Uh, yeah. And then... Just let us know what's in your cup today. How are you? How is life now that you've come out of doing this very heavy, dramatic courtroom drama? Like, how you feel? And give us the rundown, George. Yeah, well, it felt good to do the entire run this time around. Like, the Mm -hmm. last time we did the run, we were stopped because of COVID. Um, But it felt good to go back into this incredible courtroom drama. I had a great time doing it again. You know, even though like I I was a minor role in the first act of the play, being able to be the court reporter, I was able to kind of experience every courtroom scene and kind of feed off of all the actors going off of it and dealing with like getting to work with some incredible actors across the country that are like theater legends in in their own like craft of what they do. And yeah, so it was really great. I really had a great time working with Sky Brandon. The original production was directed by Marty Meriden. She was lovely to work with. She was lovely to work with too. And I'm tired. It was a a very wild run because we were in rehearsals for two weeks and then we opened the show and then had another, no, three weeks actually. And then we had another two weeks of a run. So it was like a full five weeks of just like constant working and stuff and doing eight shows a week. And that was, I haven't done a full run like that in a while. So it was interesting to to get back into like regional theater and doing that again. Yeah, so that was really great. And then now I'm kind of, I'm back home. I just came back from a wedding down in New Orleans. I went down there yeah. for four days. Yeah, I had a great time down there. And um, now I'm just chilling, trying to post off of whatever will come next. However, you know, it's pretty slow right now with all the strikes happening across Mm -hmm. our industry as a whole but but i'm optimistic about our future and i think things will get a lot better and in my cup i have a very strong gin and tonic (laughs) (laughs) a good choice thank you thank you a good choice and how do you and 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 had you seen the film before you ended up doing the play Was was it one of those okay I have. I like the last time I watched the film, it was a long time ago, but then I rewatched it during COVID because they had it on television a lot. Mm-hmm. I don't know why they kept playing it, but I felt like it was a reminder of like the fact that I was doing a run and then we had to end it because of COVID. Mm-hmm. But it was really great to watch the film. It's very different in some ways, but mm-hmm. also they did keep a lot of the essence of what the play is about as a whole but they did do some things and rejiggling of different things in the movie but i really enjoyed it it was it was a different take on the play Mm -hmm. love that love that and of course back from her whirlwind adventure in the northern land of muskoka who she unfortunately missed our fringe roundup but that's okay we have her back now it is the wonderful jillian robinson who i must say is looking very lawyerly (laughs) 
right now. And she should, when it comes time, audition for Law and Order, um, uh, uh, Criminal Intent Toronto, when, when, they, mm. when they start making that show. Because they have announced it is coming. So Don't post writer that. and actor strike, that will be a thing. So Jill, just send a screenshot of something like this. And it'll work great. <laughs> Be like a Law and Order and or Murdoch Mysteries. I would that love work. that on my artist. Yes. I feel like that's when you know you've made it if you have yes. either one of those those shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hey, Matt. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. I love to be in company of a few good men on the screen right now. <laughs> that's us. Yeah. My ensemble. Sometimes, George, I get a little funzy with with the character costumes. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I would be Joe bounding tonight. Mm -hmm. I even rolled my hair back in the little rolls that Demi Moore has with little bobby pins. And uh, yeah, my whites, but the blazer on top. I'm ready mm -hmm. to, to argue. Yeah, it's been a whirlwind of a summer, as Mac was saying. I, I had the pleasure of being in a new panto musical under the direction of Autumn Smith at the Gravenhurst Opera House. That Get was a super Smith. fun yeah, super fun contract. I'm also tired, George. I feel like I was moving a lot of drama boxes and just like having a cardio <laughs> dance party during most of it <laughs> and also quirkily falling in love. So there was like a jumble of emotion and physicality throughout the whole piece. And then I jumped right back into doing the baby toddler puppet piece I'm doing right now in the city. So I learned how to operate a Sesame Street style ostrich in the last Oh, like week. Big Bird. So that's yeah, so that's bird. that's been so I'm actually really excited to like be talking about a super like intense drama. I, I feel like <laughs> we've been very sparkly and a lot of positivity, which is lovely. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, oh, where's the grit? Let's get into mm -hmm. it. <laughs> yeah. So my drink today is kind of cheeky. So I went to a friend's birthday party the other day and I bought some peace teas. So I figured this, the movie happens at peace time. So I'm gonna uh... crack open a fresh. Peace tea to get us love through it. through this. Yeah. Love it. love it. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Jill. Ten hut to you. All right. And then of course we have my wonderful co-artistic producer, Ryan Baragovich. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Ryan. How are you? I'm all right, Mac. How are you doing? Excellent. He's a big Tom Cruise fan, everyone. So he was very I, happy when this came out. I don't know. I like Tom Cruise just fine. I wouldn't describe myself as a big fan. Not into the whole Scientology thing. But like, yeah, he's been in a lot of good movies. What can I say? Yeah. Uh, much like him, I, my ensemble, and like Jill, I suppose I'm wearing my whites because... Mm. I, Which have I, dash hounds on yeah, them. Yeah, they have, they have tiny little dachshunds on them. Um, but yeah, if any Cubans across the other side of the wall want to take a shot at me, clearly I'm someone important. So... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, and that's, I a guess, great, that, that's a great <laughs> sequence. <laughs> yes. And I suppose in my cup, I have in my The Cup Cup, hey, that's mm -hmm. the show you're watching right now. I am drinking a nice cup of Lieutenant Daniel Caffey. I got some coffee. Um, <laughs> there you go. This one's for you, Tom Cruise. <laughs> Ryan's just doing all the puns today. I love Someone it. Someone has to. Sorkin it's would approve. True. It's true. He would. <laughs> he would. Now, the best thing I think we could all better is if we all just kept walking throughout this entire thing, we all just were on treadmills. You know, like walking down like yeah. the background. Yeah, walking down the corridors oh, and talking yeah. at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Classic Sorkin yeah. staple. Yeah. It is. It is. Mm. Uh, the West Wing. Such a great show. Yeah. Such a good and, show. And what's in your cup? Well, today I am drinking my classic tangerine grapefruit crystal light. Mm. And I am wearing my red, white, and blues. Ah, uh, America. Tan. Yes, America. Ten hut to you. So what do you say we get into this piece? I mean, okay. it. I, I mean, I mean, this was kind of in the heyday of Rob Reiner. For people who don't know Rob Reiner, he started off doing All in the Family. He was Meathead, Archie's son-in-law in that show. Great show. Solid writing in that show. I just watched a really good episode all about all of that one. But then he went on to direct, and his dad's Carl Reiner, who was very good friends with Mel Brooks. Mm -hmm. And he did This is Spinal Tap. He did Princess Bride, which is one of my all-time favorites. And then the 90s, he started, he, he did this film. Then he did Misery with Kathy Bates. He did Stand By Me. Like, he was on a run. And this is where Rob Reiner kind of flexed his courtroom political muscles a bit. Because he get, because if you look at his filmography, he does them all. Like, he is one of those great, well-rounded directors of, of film and TV. Mm. So this was a solid Rob Reiner kind of classic dramatic piece but let's give our overall thoughts about this film general impressions 
would we recommend this to, to friends to watch on TV or to, you know, to rent or stream? And, you know, Jill, as you are the most militarily dressed of all of us, I feel like you are the perfect person to kick us off this time around. Mm-hmm. Great. I'm the superior of the group. Yeah, okay. You are. Don't get any ideas, though. As I... <laughs> Okay, yes. Overall thoughts and impressions about this film. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I'll start off saying that. I think there's obviously some things that are dated, like both in the film screenplay and in the scripts itself. Mm -hmm. But I think from like a sheer acting perspective and editing perspective, um, it was very nuanced. And yeah, and great. I remember I took a class in high school, it was called Social Justice, where each week or every other week, we would have to watch a movie that like dealt with a very human topic. So like Dead Man Walking or Hotel Rwanda. Mm. We actually watched some episodes of Law and Order, to be honest, (laughs) taking it back full circle. And I was watching this movie and I was like, oh, this would be a good movie to show in that Mm -hmm. type of class. Because I think there's a lot of, Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of themes to Mm -hmm. unpack, not only Mm -hmm. like from a micro perspective, like within the Marine Corps, within Mm -hmm. the system, American system, but also just Mm -hmm. like on a human and patriarchy level. And obviously, like I said, the way that certain things were portrayed might be dated or up for discussion. But I think Mm -hmm. I would definitely recommend this film for others to watch now because uh, I think there is still that, that underbelly, that subtext of like, look at how sort of, cracked and broken systems are and the sort of like monstrosity of humankind and the lengths kind of were willing to go and there's also like there's the underdog story there's like arcs of making mistakes but getting back up again yeah and I just think I also loved the pace like again it did have like a very 90s film flair pace which is like da, 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 and you're like on your toes i was saying to ryan because it was the first time i had seen the movie him and i watched it together this week and we had read the play prior to and i was like oh i'm really glad i read the play because like i feel like i would have caught up and like was following along but there's a lot of legal and marine specific jargon that's in this piece that I was like, I'm really glad that I lifted that off the page first. And then I was able to kind of just go into the movie and watch the movie with that information going in and also Mm -hmm. being able to analyze like the acting or like the choices on top of what was actually being said in the story. Yeah. So I really enjoyed it. Tip, tip my hat or salute. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think others should watch it for sure. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Going off of that, I I really, I thought, again, with me doing the play, I knew a lot of legal jargon already because I remembered the first read through of the play back in 2020. And I had no idea what half the stuff they were were talking about, because it is the American military. It's not Canadian. It's very different with the way that they like even their mannerisms, the way that they salute another officer, the things that they do. Are, like the American uh, military is a lot different. So I found that was a, a learning curve for me, for sure. And I think that going off of what Jillian said, I think it's a really important film to watch even nowadays because with films like Barbie, where they talk about gender norms and the patriarchy and all of that, mm-hmm. I think that this is a great <laughs> film to go off of that because it does kind of coexist mm-hmm. in that world of figuring out mm-hmm. what gender norms are and what we can do in the legal system to kind of help benefit men that are like, you know, more powerful or more whatever. And how somebody like Joanne Galloway in the film, mm-hmm. Commander Joanne Galloway, and the fact that she pushed through a lot of the sexism mm-hmm. that was in the movie itself, and she tried to make her mark as a lawyer. I think it's a really important film to watch, even though it's outdated with a lot of the terms and stuff that they say. I think it's also a really good film to watch in terms of the history of filmmaking and how things have changed over time. Yeah, Mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So I think people should watch it. Love that. Love that. Mm -hmm. All right, Ryan, what'd you think? Would this make your top five Tom Cruise movie list? (sighs) I don't know, man. Uh, I'm not going to go through his entire filmography right now and see if we can decide that. Honestly, like I, I like that we are being very positive here, but I have kind of, 
mixed feelings about this movie, if I'm being honest. So I had never seen it from beginning to end prior to going into planning this episode. I had seen probably all of it or almost all of it in chunks on TV over long (laughs) periods of time and not in order. And obviously this is a movie where there's a lot of complex moving parts where it's good to see it from beginning to end in order. But the impression I had of it prior to the viewing now was that, oh yeah, this movie is like so smart, of course, it's Aaron Sorkin, of course it's going to be brilliant, and uh, you know, so much complex political machinations and everything. And watching it, I watched it a few weeks prior to Jill and I watching it together in order to write these questions in advance that we're discussing here. And I left that viewing feeling like it's undeniably entertaining. It is a solid thrill ride of a movie to watch. And that final climactic courtroom battle is ah, just so Mm -hmm. fun to and exhilarating. But yes, of course, and for those watching on YouTube, we can see it right over Max's shoulders there. But I left the end of the movie kind of just feeling like, what are the questions I'm going to write about this, like for the to facilitate this discussion? And it kind of occurred to me that I feel like this movie was shockingly unthought provoking for me. That was the takeaway I had for it. It feels like it really wants to be thought provoking. It's raising all these questions about morality and honor and following mm-hmm. orders and having a code and truth and justice in the American way. But trying to crystallize that into, but what exactly does it want us to discuss? Mm-hmm. What points does it feel like it's raising in conflicting arguments it really didn't feel like it had as much to say as it's posturing that it does to me and you know i I look forward to us having this discussion proving Mm -hmm. me wrong about that if we can indeed get two hours of Mm -hmm. very stimulating discussion out of it but i don't know to me like colonel jessup is just such a cartoonish villain character (laughs) that i don't really feel like the movie's taking his side seriously, and I'm not saying it has to because I disagree with his side personally, as we will get into in a later question, but he kind of just felt like a cardboard cutout villain that Jack Nicholson's acting elevates, but doesn't necessarily seem like there is a debate being had here, even though the structures of the courtroom gives the illusion of a debate. I, I don't know, and I guess to go back to the sexism stuff that was just brought up, because yeah, if To me, there was a lot of this casual sexism being thrown around by people like Colonel Jessup when he says his very crude remark about a woman you have to salute, which I won't repeat here. And uh, and also from our hero when, you know, Lieutenant Caffey says that he's so turned on by uh, by Joanne, you know, chewing him out for being unprofessional. And I get that's not like, oh, we love him. This is an indication that he's got some growing up to do. But like... It felt this kind of very 90s casual sexism that didn't really Mm -hmm. seem like it was being interrogated by the movie itself. I think Mm -hmm. it's very much a time capsule of the culture at that time. But if I look at a movie like Silence of the Lambs, for example, from the same period where the camera really takes the men to task with Mm -hmm. their male gaze, and I didn't really feel like Rob Reiner's directing or the the cinematography in this Mm -hmm. was as critical of the male characters, it was just... Mm -hmm hoping that maybe you'll recognize the innate sexism of the statements being made Mm -hmm. and recognize that when Jack Nicholson does it, he's bad. But when Tom Cruise does it is, oh, you've got some growing up to do. And it just, I don't know, it really felt like this is dated in a lot of ways. I I would be curious to see like a stage production. Unfortunately, I missed both of the Drayton runs to see like, what do we do with this today? Is it very much treated like a product of its time? I don't know, George, if you want to comment on this or is there Mm -hmm. ways of updating it? And maybe some of the later questions will get into it if you don't want to fully unpack it here, but I leave that to you. Well, there were definitely parts of the production that they kept from the original Mm -hmm. script and whatnot. I think they tried to update a little bit of it, but a lot of it they kept in that time period. Unfortunately, they, you know, when, whenever you go anywhere in regional theater, I find that they, the clientele or the people that come and watch these shows mm-hmm. are a lot of the time, unfortunately, from that time period that they speak to that type of that show, right? And so I feel like they didn't want to change too much of it. And I remember Drayden didn't even want to do it originally, or like they were like, not they didn't want to do it, but they were a little unsure about it because of 
the fact that some of the audience members could find the swearing in the film in the production to be a little much, which I found to be like, especially with some of the other shows that have come out after that, like Book of Mormon and stuff that are a lot more crude in many ways. But I think that it's it was probably they were trying to keep it as a product of the time because of the audience itself. But yeah, like there were definitely like moments of the of even the play that I did that I was like, oh, yeah. do we have to do we have to do that part <laughs> or like words or things that people would say in the script that I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't know how I feel about that. But yeah, it's definitely a, a very outdated script. I think that, you know, Aaron Sorkin has the way of writing a lot of his stuff in general. And I think that, mm-hmm. it, you know, people always like bash on A Few Good Men for the fact that it has a lack of female characters. Mm-hmm. And it's true in many ways but it's unfortunately the way that the script was written that it was just like literally all men and one woman in the entire in the entire main cast right so it was like really interesting to watch that when they were when drayden did that show because i'm like well you know in in the climate that we are now i thought there would be it would be a little weird to do a cast that was majority like majority men but yeah i don't know there was definitely parts of it that i think are really good to talk about but i i get your opinion about it being very outdated and very also it can be a very long film for a lot of people if they don't like that courtroom stuff yeah and like i i'm into that kind of courtroom you know battle yeah. of wits and i did like i i prefaced all that with i found it very entertaining and i would yeah. recommend it on those grounds but it was less of a thinker than i expected it to be and i found yeah. that disappointing like i don't know we'll unpack I, as we go if i can just like subtly just just because we brought up the fact of like the script versus like the screenplay and like the female representation and being the female on this panel. Mm-hmm. I kind of like that from like the play's perspective that it is just one female because I think that heightens and emphasizes the sexism more, mm-hmm. which that's not what the piece is necessary. That's not what the piece mm-hmm. is about at all. But when you have one female on stage and the rest are men, when that one female speaks or when there's anything said about that one female, you can't turn it. it, It's not forgotten. Mm -hmm. So I think like doing this play, which we'll get into obviously in more questions, but just doing this play now and obviously keeping to, to the script as is, I will say too, I don't think this is a script Mm -hmm. where it's like, let's totally rework a few good men and make everyone female. Like that is not, that would not serve the story one bit. That would go, that would, nope, that's not a thing. And so, but in like, yeah, in like a 2020 and 2023 lens, like having those remarks are still said today and just having that kind of those, yeah, very like crude statements said amidst all of this jargon and Marine Mm -hmm. rumble. I think it adds like a little, an an Mm -hmm. underbelly to the other underbellies that's happening Mm -hmm. in the piece, just subtly. And it also... I think the character of Joe Galloway, like she has that power. She has a lot of power. So it's also really interesting too, to hear these things spoken about Mm -hmm. her and them going over her head or Mm -hmm. them like her, it kind of like fueling her fire a different way. I don't Mm -hmm. know. I just, Mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like I I just wanted to say that now. And I also feel like as the conversation goes along, I'll probably being the woman on this panel being like, oh yeah, let's, Let's add a comment about the sexism here because, yeah, it's clearly here. But anyways, continue on. (laughs) Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, All right. (laughs) General thoughts and impressions of the film. So just piggybacking on what Jill was saying, I completely agree with her that this film is supposed to be taking a... kind of taking it to the American military where I just looked up the stat and the most recent stat is 27.4% of military's uh, personnel are women and 72.6% um, um, American military members are men. And the fact that in the States right now, we have a male p- politician who is holding up military promotions because he is opposing female military personnel and female family members of the military getting abortion rights 
and I'm not having them being paid for, I think that just amplifies that the story and the sexism, as Joe's putting it, is still very prevalent. And so, I mean, I mean, Demi Moore would go on to do G.I. Jane in a few years where she shaved her head iconically and, you know, did that whole mil- another big military film as well. So I, so I do think there is something about this one that is timeless, unfortunately, where the sexism, the male testosterone of this, like I was watching this on the go train just this past weekend. And oh my goodness, did I ever feel the male testosterone coming out, coming out of my little tiny iPad as like all the men are marching around in their uniforms. And just that opening sequence of the precision drill of all of them just like it, you just feel the masculinity of this film. And then I love that Rob Reiner cuts from the military doing their drills and stuff like that to Demi Moore going into that meeting requesting the case. Like that, I think Rob Reiner really did try and give Galloway a lot of runway to play with as much as he could within the script's parameters. But he definitely uh, never was- shot it. Hmm? Sorry, I will say, to speak into, like, 90s sexism, though, the scene where she is, like, roughly taking down those crab legs and eating crab meat off of a butter (laughs) knife, that scene is in there for all the men watching to get their jollies off on Demi Moore. Like, there are some scenes of Demi Moore that they're like, we are playing right into the hands Mm -hmm. of the 90s men that are watching this movie. But anyways, continue, Mac. (laughs) Yes. And that's exactly, like, this is one of those films where... It is dated. I mean, the fact that we have that horrible Jack Nicholson line where he describes Tom Cruise's white dress uniform in a very derogatory way. I, I, like, I don't know, George. Did your production keep that line as it is? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, the once movie, again, did. the movie calls back to that line a second it time does. in a way the play doesn't, which is also interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. No, they. So got yeah. That. Yeah, so it's one of those things where I really enjoy the film because I'm a trial political junkie. Like, I just did a big rewatch of Law & Order. I just took a few seasons of Law & Order because I can. His Law & like, like Beetlejuice. It's going to appear A few in seasons, Mac. That would have taken you, like, like a, an entire a few season. <laughs> a few okay. weeks. Because you watch two or three episodes and it's like you're cooking dinner, making lunch, you know, puttering around the house. That type of thing there. You know, you put an episode on the back. You don't need to see it. You can just hear it and go, okay, yeah, we're at this point of the formula. Okay, all right. And I mean, th- this is such an interesting point in Aaron Sorkin's career where he hasn't done the West Wing yet, I'm pretty sure. West Wing came out yeah. a few years later. So this it is did. kind of his first foray into that realm of politics. And he still loves the courtroom stuff because he just did To Kill a Mockingbird a few years ago, which is now coming to Toronto this winter, which I'm very excited about. I really want to mm-hmm. see that for very good things about his adaptation of To Kill a Mockingbird. The fact that it apparently starts with the trial and then kind of flashes forward, flashes back, which I'm very interested about. So I'm definitely getting my tickets to that. Mm-hmm. But I, would, I wouldn't mind Eric Christopher taking another crack at the script and, you know, maybe tweaking it up from the 80s to like getting a, changing a few lines to make it a bit more palpable for modern audiences. I mean, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. To Kill a Mockingbird worked great for Aaron Sorkin. Camelot did not. <laughs> it, it was bashed for his rewriting of that particular book so air Sork is a fascinating writer but overall i just really enjoy this film i mean i mean i remember being back in elementary school and us quoting the scene of you can't handle the truth to elementary each other school elementary school <laughs> oh my we, gosh like grade seven grade eight you know you know you, you know you would turn to someone and go eric you can't handle the truth you know or i'd be like are like, we playing truth or dare what's happening <laughs> no 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 no, no. We were just film buffs, and, and, and you know, like after a Friday night hangout, we, we watched one of these, and that just became one of those classic scenes that you would quote to each other just just to get a kick out of people. So well, you know, yeah. it, right? Because it's just it's so, and the movie does it. I mean, I don't want to say hammy, but it is very big that scene. I mean, Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson just lay into it, and just there's yeah. no subtlety at all. But it yeah. works. I mean, it's so iconic. I mean, Jack Nicholson is on screen for what ten minutes. But Probably it's one of his even. most, but it's like one of his most iconic like <laughs> roles that anybody, like, I, I go to anybody and say, you can't handle the truth. You know, most people, I guarantee you like nine times, eight times out of 10, they'll know the movie for that one. So you probably don't know the rest of the movie or anything that leads up to the movie, but it's great. I mean, this is just such, I mean, Rob Ryan to put together just such, such a star-studded cast, which we'll dive into. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I recommend this film to anyone. I mean, like, I mean, if you want to go on like a big kind of like trial junkie, 
you know, like Marathon, this would be in there. The Verdict from the 80s is another really solid one. Jodie Foster and the Accused is a very hard film, but a very powerful film to watch. Got her Oscar. To Kill a Mockingbird, 12 Angry Men. Like, this definitely is up there in, like, my top five, like, trial courtroom drama movies. Yeah. Where, and, lo- where, go for it. No, I just wanted to say, like, even in the stage production, mm-hmm. every time that Benedict Campbell said, you can't handle the truth, the entire <laughs> audience would, like, clap for him. <laughs> like, yeah. like, every, That's why we came. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's it. Or, or, or people would be like, ah, yeah, there's the line. And I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah, my like, God. He Truthfully, yes. Mm-hmm. I like I, ev- al- almost every show. <laughs> I imagine playing that role on stage is kind of like a Stratford actor doing uh, to be a Hamlet. Yeah, Hamlet. Yeah, to be not to be oh, your Hamlet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, something so, that where yeah. like they know the actor is going, the audience is going to be saying the line almost ahead of them, so they have to be like really quick yeah. to get to that line because it's building and building to that line, and you know it's coming. So, so yeah. I guarantee you, you, like that actor's like, crap, I got to say it now because. If well, those lines are so be- tough, too, because, mm-hmm. like, there's so much pressure and expectation of, like, you don't want to say it inorganically, right? Yeah. But it's like, mm-hmm. you yeah. know it's coming. Yeah. And on top yes. of that, and on top of Jack Nicholson's performance is so ingrained in your brain with how he says that line. It's like, any actor who has to you know, play that part, it's like, how do you play it? Because it either are going to go big like Jack Nicholson, everybody's going to think like Jack Nicholson, or you go another and people are like, well, that's not the way it's supposed to be said. Like, it's one of those yeah. great, like, it's just a great moment in film where everybody know, or majority of people know that film and know for, for this scene for this film. It's just so good. And I recommend it to people all the time. And my roommate had never seen it. So, you know, I showed it to her because she was like, because she had watched maybe a scene or two on TV, but I hadn't actually, like, sat down and watched it in full. And, I mean, it starts off with a bang uh, mm-hmm. of, of that murder sequence. It's just so on right away. And I will say the technically, only thing they're that, not guilty of murder. Technically not. <laughs> and that's the other thing I love, I love this film. It is, it is morally gray. And I think it's Downey at the end who, do, who, who does the, what did we do wrong? Right? Because in his mind, he followed the order. Mm-hmm. Why should he be kicked out of the military dishonorably for doing what he was told to do? Because they like, should have stuck up for Willie. It's right? morally gray, but immorally red. Hey. No? Oh. Did you order the code red? <laughs> also, I love it. George that you're wearing a red, red hoodie. Red yeah. I am. Cold yeah. red, cold red. Yes. Cold red sweater. Well done. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know. But you but know, yeah. you know, but I find it really like I love the beginning of the film because mm-hmm. in the play, mm-hmm. they start off with Downey and Dawson actually saying like what they're charged with and like what mm-hmm. they're what like that. And it goes directly into Kathy and Sam talking at the beginning. Mm-hmm. But in the actual movie, they mm-hmm. start with the murder and it goes into like this like huge military mm-hmm. sequence. Mm-hmm. And then the first major actor you see is Demi Moore, which I thought was really cool because they changed a little bit of how the beginning was, mm-hmm. like the opening of the film was going to be like. And I really enjoyed that. I thought it really showed the military in a really cool way. Like the different choreography yeah. that they did for it was incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and I mean, once again, that's just Rob Reiner being such a good storyteller where you open with the murder and then or murder because yeah. I, mean, I would view it as murder. Apparently, the film says otherwise to, about these yeah. guys. The law says otherwise. The law. <laughs> there you go. Either way. Yeah. So, 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 yes, yeah, so you open with that, but then right away you cut to that precision drilling, which right away tells you exactly the world you are in and the world mm-hmm. these men are coming from. And it set, it tells you right away the world that Demi Moore is walking into because then you get the precision uh, marching band in there too. Like mm-hmm. it tells you so much right away about this system that is the, the, the like in the sandbox we're going to be playing in. It's yeah. brilliant nonverbal storytelling. But the only thing that bugs me about this film is that end credit music because it ends with this Tom Cruise walks out of the court and then da 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 da. da. It's like okay, hold on, did I send your seventy six trombones and like the Music Man? Like what is this marching band music? Again? Like find another piece of music, Rob Reiner, not the marching band. I think honestly though, Mac, I think that's clever. I didn't even think about uh, that tonal shift, but like it, it it's bookends. So just, what, what, we'll we'll yeah, get into yeah. this in further questions, but yes. I have something to say on that as we mosey on. Forward. All right, bookmarking that for later. But let's get yeah. into the cast because this is an all-star cast 
of stage and screen. And you know it's a Rob Reiner movie because Christopher Guest shows up in a supporting role. And if, if people who don't know who he is, he was in This Is Spinal Tap, and he was the man with six fingers in Princess Bride. He is just one of those great character actors who shows up and does a bang up job. And I was looking for him because I forgot he was in it. So he doesn't get my shout out, but he's really good. But let's give our thoughts on the cast. Who did stand out to you? George, since you've just done this show and you've had this very incredible cast that you've worked with, who stood out to you in the film and how, you know, like, like, what, like watching them do this film, did you have the flash and go, oh, my guy did a totally different take and did it better or like, what was Kevin Bacon doing here? This isn't the way we interpreted the role. <laughs> yeah. You know, that type of thing there. Like, well, actually, well, actually, I there were moments where I did not like the acting. Mm. So I, okay, so like when I did the play, I found that a lot of the actors in the production let the moments actually kind of happen. Mm. Whereas in the film, I felt like a lot <laughs> of the moments were really rushed and people were like, like lying through the dialogue, which I understand why they were doing that. But some of the parts I found were a little wooden in like mm -hmm. the way that they kind of did it. But there were other parts that I really enjoyed. I, of course, I think Tom Cruise was really good in it. You know, he was a very young heartthrob actor at that time. So you could tell yeah. that he was, you know, he was at his prime at that moment. Mm -hmm. Do I like yeah. the guy? Not really. I don't like Tom Cruise that much, but whatever. <laughs> But, uh, you know, Demi Moore, I was really impressed with how she did uh, Commander Joanne Galloway. I think she, in essence, really played off of the men in the cast. And I think she really fought, knew how to fight back in a very nuanced and very great way. Uh, also, you know, like Demi Moore is known to be a beautiful crier. That, that was her thing in Hollywood. So there was like some moments where she had like some breakdowns where she just like, her acting was really good in that <laughs> but um but no i think she did quite well i wasn't a huge fan of dawson or downey i yeah. kind of found them to be i don't know like weird at moments like they were awkward but the guy the people that we had for the stage show they actually mm -hmm. brought more life into the character i found and yeah kevin kevin bacon he was okay but he was not my favorite. Jack Nicholson, for sure. He was he brought a lot to the role and he made it iconic, I think. So, yeah, probably Jack Nicholson and Demi Moore were the two that I really I thought were the best out of all of them. But that was my own opinion. Love it. Ryan. I love Kevin Pollack. Kevin Pollack's great as Sam Weinberg in this. I don't know. I just think he's like every time he opens his mouth, it's both funny, but also has like a serious undercurrent to it. I think he handled this like kind of side character who's still quite important pretty well. I guess you have to talk to Tom Cruise. No, I, 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 <laughs> well, I like Ron, you are his biggest fan. <laughs> yeah, clearly. No, I thought he's very good in this. I think he like, I don't know. I think there's weird things about this movie, the play it's based on the character of Daniel Caffey, but like, I think we spend way too much time concerned with his daddy issues, which feels like unrelated to the rest of the plot. Um, but I think, you know, he sells this role very well. He's good in like the, you know, in the, oh, you are a young man who has grown up to do opening parts. And then we do see him go through this arc by the end where he is yelling on the stand there. I think he sells the role very well in the first scene we see of him where it's like, well, who's the right man for the job? And then it cuts to him being immature on the baseball field. <laughs> but then when he's having the conversation with the other lawyer about uh, what arrested for possession of a condiment that we, you know, it's a lot of it is in the writing too, but in Tom Cruise's performance, he really sells the, you think I'm just being immature and not really caring about what you're saying, but I have the sharp legal mind and I am like three steps ahead of you opponent. I am the smart character in this Sorkin scene because every Sorkin scene will have a smart character and a dumb character and that's the entire like skeleton key of his dramaturgy but yeah. I yeah like but he, he sells it well like this is very tough dialogue to handle with ease and he does it with ease <laughs> and I think that is something that is worthy of a shout out regardless of what people think of him and the way that his life and career have developed since this yeah I 
Jack Nicholson, everybody knows he is like the big highlight of this movie, even if he's barely in it. I don't feel the need to blow smoke up his ass anymore. This is such an <laughs> this is such an iconic role of his in, in a very storied career. Like that, that's not nothing. Yeah, yeah, Demi Moore is good. I, I have nothing to add to George what you've said on that. Yeah, it's a solid cast. Everyone's, I think, hitting hard, doing their best to bring their A game. Mm -hmm. Others can comment if there's other people I've left out that they'd like to mention. Jill? Yeah, okay. I have two that I definitely want to shout out. And mm -hmm. obviously I'll start. Tom Cruise isn't of the two, but I'll start just kind of piggyback off of what Ryan and George have said as well. Yeah, this just, it's like dripping in Tom, young Tom Cruise charisma. And like Ryan mm -hmm. said, like he attacks the text with such ease. It's, I went into reading the script knowing that the role was played by Tom Cruise. But when Ryan and I read it, I read for Kathy and like, as I was reading it off the page, I was like, okay, this is like Tom Cruise. I could totally see Tom Cruise playing this. And I think he did a really good job of transferring mediums, like taking this character and then bringing it to film. I was like, this is exactly how I read this character on the page. And you are playing him exactly how he should be played on the screen, mm -hmm. which is like really, it was like a really cool thing to, to explore or to be exposed to. And okay, yeah, so that that covers Tom Cruise. Before I go into the two I want to shout out, I am was a huge fan of Jack Nicholson's performance. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna lie. I know hot take, Jack, don't mm -hmm. hate this Jill, but like hey. <laughs> I I think it was blown out of proportion for me. Like I had spent so many years not seeing the film until, like I said, like this past week. And like that court scene is iconic and it is amazing. But I don't know. I like, as I was reading it off the page, for some reason, I kept picturing Anthony Hopkins as him. And this is not to say- this. Because Anthony Silence of the Lambs is a better movie. Yeah. Well, I also haven't seen that movie either though, right? Like, so- <gasps> I know. Yeah. I know. Oh. Melissa, relax, oh. relax. I'm busy. I'm literally a working actor. Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. So back to, so obviously- I would like Anthony Hopkins and Jack Nicholson have played kind of similar iconic, like, right. Like maniacal monsters in their career. So I guess that was kind of like my fault for kind of tagging Jessup in Anthony Hopkins light, but I just, I wanted him to be more of a monster. And I mm -hmm. totally pick up what Ryan was saying earlier of how he is kind of like this cartoon villain, but that beginning scene to me, like when he's talking to Kendrick and it's Markinson, right? Yeah. yeah. It just, it's, it fell flat for me. And I was like, this is the man that it has this massive sort of like explosion in the court scene. And it wasn't until they met with him in Cuba and he's like smoking a cigar and says the very like disgusting remarks to uh, Joe and team that I was like, okay, there's the like ty tyranny that I want. And so mm -hmm. I guess it's like, part of it was like, okay, cool. There's a character arc, there's a growth, but I just found, and even in the court scene, like I wasn't afraid of him. And I think with this character, like there is a lot of pathos. There's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of damage that this character has gone through and that society has placed upon someone of his rank and status. But I just, I wanted to be a little bit more spooked, like almost like a little bit more agency, which is, yeah, it's interesting. And again, I think it's only because it's such an iconic scene and character that my expectations were like super, super high. An amazing performance and like, yeah, garnered her him some like amazing roles, I mean, awards, but yeah. Anyways, that's on Jessup. Okay. The two things, I, two people I want to mention that I loved. Kevin Pollock, yes, Ryan's already said, but for the same reasons, I think he's so talented. I remembered him as we were watching him like, oh my God, he plays Lainey Boggs' dad in the 90s movie, She's All That, which I loved yeah. watching as a kid and a teenager. And he's like this super like silly dad who like watches Jeopardy in his like board shorts and gets all the questions. Like he's hilarious in that. And then to see him in this role, I love how everyone knows what I'm talking about. That makes me so happy. Yeah. But in this scene, yeah, in this movie, like there is that contrast. Like I love watching movies where I've seen an actor in their like comedic mm -hmm. element, but then like 
to see them, yeah, to see them bake in those like darker dramatic tones on top mm-hmm. of already being the comic relief is like, I love it. So tipping my hat to that. My standout, I think even more than Kevin Pollack, was Kiefer Sutherland as Kendrick. Mm-hmm. Because that character is the scariest character for me because mm-hmm. his morals mm-hmm. are not changing. Like mm-hmm. he will not be beat. Mm-hmm. And I think like as the play mm-hmm. ends and as the movie ends, we don't see where that human goes. And he's he going to get promoted all the way up the chain. <laughs> no, Kevin Bacon's going to go arrest him. And that's, yeah, that's one of the exactly, last lines exactly. of the movie. Exactly. No. <laughs> but like he is steadfast in like, there is no getting inside of his psyche. And I think mm-hmm. Keeper Sutherland did a wonderful job of like, when he says the moment of the two books by his bedside, are like the handbook and the bible i was like yep and those books are (laughs) never leaving your bedside you know Mm -hmm. and i just think it was like such a subtle anytime he was on the stage Mm -hmm. he was just dripping in in like yeah in kind of like the darker hues that being a part of something like the marine corps paints you in even when they're like walking down the hallway he's catch me up he's the one that brings them to the evidence room yes he does when they're walking down that corridor and he's leading that charge, I'm like, get out of the way because that man is not moving for you. You know, mm-hmm. like, I just think he did a really good job of physicalizing, again, mm-hmm. characterizing that that character from the text mm-hmm. to the screen. Anyways, yeah. that is a lot, but mm-hmm. Mac. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll also say Kevin Pollock as um, Lieutenant Sam Weinberg because he's just such a wonderful scene partner to Tom Cruise where he is kind of like the dad or the uncle figure to Tom Cruise's lack of father that he's going through. Cause he is a young, he's a dad of a young child. They have that wonderful scene of them walking the baby in the stroller before going to Cuba. Like, you know, like, I mean, I mean, just the, the first scene with him where they're, you know, talking about like assigning the cases and like, they're like, all right, Weinberg, you're teaming up with Kathy. And he's like, ah, crap. Like, come on. Like, not me. Like, that's everything there. Like, like he just has such wonderful chemistry. He's got with no Tom responsibility Cruise. whatsoever. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Great. Yeah. And then, I mean, also, I just found myself agreeing with this character the most, where he has that great scene where, like, you know, Demi Moore and him go at it. And it's one of those things of, why do you hate them so much? And he does that because they picked on the little guy. They're supposed to defend people when they didn't. Like, uh, 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 they, instead, they took their aggression out on him instead of, you know, doing the right thing and being, you know, being part of the platoon. And it's like, okay, all right, I get this guy. Like, he's a dad, and, and he's all about defending the little guy. And this case would be a challenge for someone like him who doesn't agree with this. I would love to see more of him in the film just because he's such a fascinating character. Like, I would love to see, this, see if him, like, of him going to the airbase, getting the two random guys to, like, come with him to the courtroom, and they have, like, nothing else to do. It's like, okay, I just want you to come here and just sit. It's like, how did he convince those two guys to come in and sit in that room because that's great. But I also the other shout out I will give is to JT Walsh as mm-hmm. Lieutenant Colonel Markinson Mark. because mm-hmm. oh. he does so much with so little because you got Kendrick over there who's like scene chewing villainy on one end. You got Jack Nichols on the other end who's also like scene chewing villainy, cigar smoking back in there. And you got him with his great kind of 90s, late 80s glasses. And just like kind of like the old president's men like shows up in the back of the car type thing there. And he, he doesn't say a ton, but he's always giving there giving the looks and reacting a lot. And he also had actually worked with Jack Nicholson doing Hoffa, which came out the same weekend as A Few Good Men, which pissed Jack Nicholson off about the movie. Was that this big Oscar winning movie Hoffa was supposed to be his big break. And so he gets <laughs> remembered more for A Few Good Men. But J.T. Walsh did that. And actually, he died a few years later of a heart attack. Mm. This is one of his last roles that he did. But he just had such a presence. And, mm. you know, when he unfortunately completes suicide, you get the guilt. He really does show the guilt of what he is living with, of being the morally right guy in the room, but he's got two kind of, you know, obstructionist, old-school macho men of Nicholson and Kendrick there who are, you know, going to steamroll him because there's that whole backstory of he's kind of always been nipping at, what's his name, Jessup's heels. 
but Jessup got the promotions over him, probably because mm-hmm. Jessup played by the rules a bit more and played and played the political and, and played the political game more because he was less moral than than uh, uh, Markinson was. So there's a fascinating mm-hmm. dynamic there in that, and I just yeah. thoroughly enjoyed his performance and just the tragedy of that role that he ultimately doesn't get to get, take the scene, actually take it to Jessup. Yeah, I I think I I do think that Markinson is a extremely underrated character i think Mm -hmm. it's a very difficult role to play even in the stage production mike Mm sarah yeah he played it he played the role and he did the part very well and then the original 2020 production was jimmy zahn who played Mm -hmm. markinson and he did a very good job with that too but it's a very difficult role because Mm -hmm. it's a guy who is morally he knows what happened is Mm -hmm. wrong but he cannot handle the guilt anymore Mm -hmm. And like what he does with it. So it's really, it's a really pivotal and a really important character to have in the film. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad Mm -hmm. that they kept that story arc alive because I think it's really important. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Let's get into our favorite production or design element of the film. Ryan, would you like to go first on this one? Sure. I quite like the costumes that Mm -hmm. everybody wears all the times here because Well, one, I think just in general, military, uniform, regalia, everything they're wearing all the time has symbolic meaning and what Mm -hmm. they choose to wear in a given circumstance. And like, I'm not a military person, obviously, by any stretch. And I'm sure a military viewer might even read more meaning into these things than I'm capable of doing. Mm -hmm. But like, I think there's just a lot really going on here. The fact that an important piece of evidence in the case Mm -hmm. turns out to be the whereabouts of a certain character's clothes Mm. means that there has to be a lot of attention to detail put mm-hmm. on this, that there's an exchange in the climactic scene of the trial about, you know, I'm going to read a list of your clothes, including the colonel's underwear. I hope that's not a matter <laughs> of national security. Like the clothes just feel so central to the narrative and the mystery and what's going on in all of this. And like in particular, Tom Cruise's costumes tell a story as he matures as a character that he's always wearing this very unconventional clothes. He doesn't respect the uniform. And then as it goes on, he becomes more and more invested mm-hmm. in what he's doing, the task at hand, the rule of law, the trial, and his formality grows with that in his costume. So yeah, I'm sure there's a whole other little things we could pick at costume wise, but in general, I'll just mm-hmm. put that out as a blanket statement that I think the costume was very well chosen mm-hmm. with good attention to detail. Mm-hmm. Very good. Very good. George? Yeah, for me, even doing like the, the production, I found the costuming to be the big part of the entire production mm-hmm. because each shirt had like the different colors that represented how senior you were in the military. And I feel like that that really shows a lot because, for example, Affy being being a junior lieutenant and then and then Joanne Galloway being from Internal Affairs and mm-hmm. having that interaction with him at the beginning where she, where he's like, well, do you have any jurisdiction over me? And she was like, well, I'm special counsel for internal affairs. I think like the costuming can really show a lot mm-hmm. between the different, the power dynamics between the characters. And I think that's some, something really important to definitely acknowledge, especially within the military, because it's such a, an important thing. But also the set design. I think the courtrooms were really, the courtroom was really well designed i think the cinematography and like the way they filmed it was really cool they definitely really played off on the military and i really enjoyed that mm-hmm. yeah this is what the inside of a courtroom looks like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. i will piggyback off ryan and george and say the costumes yeah. as well were, were one of Ooh, my nice. shout outs just because once again I, I remember there was an interview with meryl streep where she talked about how she had just done doubt and devil wears prada and she talked about how doing a role where the outfit is so important because wearing the nun's habit a certain way, the way you put it together was so critical to the role. It's the same way with the military. There is only one way to do this right. And just that scene, Markinson dressing himself Mm -hmm. for his death. Once again, it's the attention to detail. And you, I mean, Rob Barton would only feel comfortable showing the close-ups of the buttons going on. The gloves, the sword, the gun, all that stuff. If he had full faith in his costume designer of, you have given me the right buttons, the right jacket, the right shirt, the right gloves, that I will not get, you know, like lambasted if I, 
if, if it's like the wrong thing. And so the costume designer did a fantastic job with living up to that standard because people will know if like, you know, Kevin Bacon's wearing the wrong stripe on his arm to represent who he is or, you know, any of these roles, like, cause military role, like I, I, I title and all that stuff plays a big role in, in the hierarchy of how this all plays out. So, you know, it's but you very don't important. need a patch on your arm to have on. No, you took it. No, <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that. Uh, I'm sorry, you got to be quicker. Yeah. <laughs> I was being patient, but you know uh, what? I'm going to speak I, out yeah, in this room now. Who's got time for patience? I'm going to stand <laughs> up and I'm going uh, to maybe make a mistake in court, but then figure yeah. it out in the next time. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say that, like, how mm-hmm. awesome does that? I didn't even think about that till just now. Like, it mm-hmm. hits home that line that mm-hmm. Kathy says to Dawson. You don't need a badge on your arm to have honor. And it's like, even it's just, it just hits home again, like Mm -hmm. how restricted and Mm -hmm. containerized. I don't Mm -hmm. know if that's a word, but it is now that these, I like containerized better. We're going to stick with that. Yeah. Like all of these characters Mm -hmm. are, and in real life, like they restrict so much so that humanity is kind of at the wayside. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll say my other thing, just because we did costumes a lot. I'll say that my other big thing is just Rob Reiner's direction of this film. Because once again, courtroom dramas are very tricky in the sense that they are very static. I mean, that's why they work really great as a setting for a play, you know, because it's a bottle uh, episode type thing where like you're in a very tight space. The I, You have the chairs, you have the desk, you have the stand, you're good. On film, you got to find a way to make that dynamic enough that's going to keep the audience actively involved. And I mean, I mean, and also in the military alone, everything is very color coded, very kind of, it's not flashy. You're not, you're not going to get the big flashy, fancy sets and this because it's government, it's military, it's cold, it's stoic, it's sterile, it's containerized. So finding a way to make that dynamic and having the space and the characters come alive within the space is the son of a, is the one that's going to sound a really good director like a Rob Reiner who just knows how to take the story and translate it well from stage to screen and work well with Aaron Sorkin's writing and find a way to make every scene even if it is just a courtroom scene as dynamic as possible with the way you work with your editor and your cinematographer to get the lighting just right to get like finding just those fun ways of of taking a scene and doing it a little bit differently enough that's going to be dramatic and keep the tension without being like okay here we go we're back on Corman again he's gonna take the stand another question and answer type thing like every time a new person comes up to that stand it's a different dynamic that he's got the, the actors playing out like uh, like the way Kendrick answers and does his examination is completely different than the way the doctor does it compared to like I, I forget like who the base guy is but where it's like do you know where the mess hall is it's not in the book but do you know like every yeah. one of those exchanges thank you yeah, but like every one of those exchanges is dynamic in its own way and is shot in a bit of a different way to give everybody a chance to react and show a different thing. It's really hard to do, but Rob Marshall did uh, Rob Marshall. Rob Reiner did a terrific it's a court job. Marshall, not a Rob Marshall. There you <laughs> go. Ha ha. Uh, well done. Joe, I, is there, hmm? Sorry, George. No, I completely agree with you. I think the stage production is so simple with the way that they mm-hmm. kind of uh did the set design as a whole because there wasn't a lot of change (laughs) overall like they changed it a little bit but in the film it was great to like see like cuba and to see like like all of the like them going to bars and the chain like them in a car like doing different things that were very different from the play Mm -hmm. it felt like the movie kind of moved a little bit as where the play kind of felt like Mm -hmm. it's a very static location that Mm -hmm. you have to try to find ways to make the acting really great Mm -hmm. so that people feel like the story's kind of Mm -hmm. moving along right yeah yeah Yeah. exactly wonderful jill is there anything else you want to add yeah of course yeah so mine actually wasn't wardrobe although yes i stand by that absolutely plays directly into the piece and it's executed beautifully on the screen mine kind of piggybacks off of you mac like under the umbrella of direction but i would say probably more so in like the editing and the cinematography and i want to talk about it through the lens of transitions in this movie i think the transitions were impeccable and when i say that i mean like in between the very like 
Eddie's scenes, which basically this movie is sewn together with those scenes, but the transition moments of showing the mon- monuments, like showing the all of the things in the National Mall, right? And it's just mm-hmm. like, you see the, yeah, the Washington Monument, you see another statue, you see the Abraham Lincoln Memorial as like a transition thing. And it's a reminder of like, this story that's happening now is it, it's like a macro reminder of like mm-hmm. pomp and circumstance USA USA mm-hmm. and I think again going back to what I pinned earlier Mac of like these transitions really helped paint the tone of the piece because mm-hmm. like from the be- beginning moment and the end moment so the beginning of like we have this we already talked about it but like Santiago being assaulted and the sort of like grit and grotesqueness of the Marine Corps and then instantly snapped into a wonderful marching band and like (laughs) ironed costumes and red, white, and blue and this sort of like cheery, happy. I remember even saying to Ryan, like, wow, that is a tone shift. Okay, we are on this roller coaster ride. We just went from a drop to a twisty turn, you know what I mean? And then like I didn't even think about it, Mac, but at the end of the movie, it's kind mm-hmm. of the same thing. It's like you have this really stoic, intense closure of mm-hmm. you just taken in all of the meaty moments that happen in that courtroom. And then mm-hmm. you're taken off with like a little marching band thing. And I think, again, it kind of satirizes what's going on and how mm-hmm. like it's, it is all pomp and circumstance. And we are still having these issues today. Even, even as I pointed this out to Ryan, like one of the transitions before they go into Joe, Sam and um, Kathy having one of their many nights of Chinese food and unpacking mm-hmm. the case, they show the exterior of their house. And mm-hmm. it's just like a street a, a, in American civilization, yep. but the color of the house bricks are red, white, and blue. So oh, I popped you that, that and took us back. And I, I was didn't. like, yeah, I was like, that maybe wasn't intentional, but mm-hmm. dramaturgically, I'm gonna point that out because that's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's like showing they're still as much as they want to escape it or debunk it. They are still encased in red, white, and blue. Mm-hmm. And I just think, yeah, like it's in these no speech and a lot of the time just like Mm -hmm. a photograph um transition that is Mm -hmm. constantly popping Mm -hmm. that propaganda in the back of your mind as you watch Mm -hmm. these humans Mm -hmm. that are in that Mm -hmm. space Mm -hmm. go through this case yeah yeah love that all right Mm -hmm. let's get into the next question which is a meaty one and it's based on your familiarity with aaron sorkin's original play how would you appraise this film's adaptation of the work? So, George, since you have just literally come off doing this show, how would you appraise this adaptation? And is there anything you would take from the film and bring it back into the stage show that wasn't there or vice versa that you wish had been translated better from the stage show to the film? Yeah. So for me, the big one was Markinson. Because, mm. for example, in the uh, stage production of of a few good men i found like markinson was never he never actually talked to kathy after their initial meeting in cuba he Mm -hmm. sent a transfer order to kathy that he got from from the pentagon and Mm -hmm. he stole he stole with in under gunpoint to an in, like an individual there that was working mm-hmm. at the Pentagon, and he got the transfer order that was actually changed by Jessup mm-hmm. and whatnot. But in the actual film, he never gave him that. He just told him like, "Oh, I, it's not true. Like, there's not mm-hmm. there, there's nothing true about that." But there was no evidence at the time that he gave him. And then the fact that they put him into a motel and mm-hmm. they had him uh, marshals. Yeah, it was interesting because I found like for him being doing counterintelligence for such a long time, I would think he would get out of that very quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he was like in that room kind of gave up on everything instead of like having the letter sent to the parents of Santiago and actually doing the suicide in it in somewhere that a location that nobody knew. It was interesting, that adaptation of it in the film. Mm -hmm. And I found, I don't know if I liked it. I thought that I preferred (laughs) 
the original adaptation of it, but I thought because they made him more of a mystery character of like, who is Markinson and where is he going next and whatever, instead mm -hmm. of having him in kind of like locked away in one location and for him to kind of break into Kathy's car was an interesting mm -hmm. um, take on the, on the original screen uh, screenplay or uh, mm -hmm. uh, script. But mm -hmm. uh, so that part I didn't really like as much. Uh, it was very different. But also, I did like the way that they kind of separated some of the scenes from like the staff mm -hmm. meeting to other parts of the scene to make it work differently, mm -hmm. which is brings me back to my original point of like how some parts were changed with the way that they kind of highlighted one part in one scene and then highlighted a different part in a different scene from the original play. And I thought that worked and I really enjoyed mm -hmm. how joe and kathy and sam had their own individual meeting outside of the staff meeting where in the original play the staff meeting was very male dominated and she felt very attacked by everybody mm -hmm. instead she was like in her own office they went in they talked to her i thought that was a really mm -hmm. interesting change in the way mm -hmm. that they kind of changed the power dynamic because mm -hmm. clearly joe had more power than kathy in that moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. If I can piggyback off the Go, George there, Matt. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I totally agree with you, George. And I, you said this earlier too, that the movie, like it almost like allows there to be more life mm -hmm. alongside the story that the play mm -hmm. script is like, and again, kind of just going back to what I just said of the, like the transitions mm -hmm. and moments, but even talking about it through the role of Kathy, like, I like that we kind of get to see him as like an average like all american citizen too right like mm -hmm. playing baseball pulling mm -hmm. his car over to the side of the road and buying a random magazine like yeah. and then yeah like seeing joe out of uniform in like a, a fun sweater and jeans as they like unpack the case like i think there was just like more breather room of like yeah adding in kind of day-to-day -day life of Americans, as well mm -hmm. as like the high stakes situation that these people are having to go into work to every day. So I really liked, cause I found like with the script, like obviously it's a totally different medium, but, and you do need a lot of exposition to kind of get to that final court scene, but there really isn't a lot of like room to paint mm -hmm. life alongside or outside all of this going on. So that's, I, I love that the film kind of gives us that peek into mm -hmm. the story as well. I also kind of like, and we danced around this by talking about all these other characters, but I find that this story, like both the script and the screenplay, obviously highlights, but doesn't put center stage the underdogs. So I'm talking about like Downey, I'm talking about mm -hmm. Joe, I'm talking about Markinson, I'm talking about all these people that like, are given a rank, they're given a status, but they have to report to someone or they can't fully understand or they can't fully be themselves. And I think we find that very strongly in Markinson, Joe and Downey, just to kind of use these three characters as examples, you see that kind of struggle in those characters arcs by the way that the actors are playing them. Like obviously Downey, absolutely. Like, my heart breaks in the court scene when he just like does not have the wherewithal to understand what's going on. And it's like all the way from that spectrum of the all American man to someone like Markinson, where he so much has the wherewithal to know like that he can take his own life, like to mm -hmm. see those. And then you have someone like Joe who, it's a woman mm -hmm. and has like a whole other list of, of reasons of not being able to kind of break through and have limitations too. But I just think that's something that you can't really get fully by through like a script or through, through a stage production, yeah. just because the medium doesn't really allow that. Like the actor is obviously giving their all on that stage or like in this, in the script, mm -hmm. like it's mapped out very well, like, but it's, there's something about film that really allows that to be colored and contrasted because of like the camera lens, right? Like the view that we're mm -hmm. given, we can kind of be spoon fed that sort of those arcs. 
Yeah. So, so I, I actually mm-hmm. like, I think this, I don't say this often, but I actually think it works like better as a film than as a script. Obviously there's wiggle room to do mm-hmm. a both. And like some people might disagree, but mm-hmm. anyways, yeah, that's my thoughts. I'll piggyback off you, Jill, just because I don't know if it's because I came to this through the film first, where the film is just so ingrained. And even when reading the play, I was always a bit jarred with like, oh, okay, we're going it this way, not the film's way. So I found it fascinating that way and just a exploration of adaptation and how, I mean, we talked about this when we t- when Ryan and I have talked about doubt in the past, where yeah. when you're taking these bottle kind of tight plays and then expanding them into film, it's not, I, 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 I can never want to be gratuitous in, how you expand it for the sake of expansion. But I found this film's adaptation did a really good job of knowing where to change, do some tweaking. Like Aaron Sorkin knew like, hey, in this film, I actually can take us to Cuba. Let's go and do scenes in the room, in the barracks, in Cuba. You know, that type of thing there. Let's actually go to, to, to Kathy's house repeatedly and see him doing his thing. Let's go to the baseball diamond and hit, a, and hit, and hit some balls. because. It just creates the more of the world, right? Like it's one of those things of there's such a world outside that courtroom that is bleeding in and infusing what's going on in this courtroom. And by actually going to Jessup's base, uh, like in Guantanamo, like like in Guantanamo, like as much as yes, Jessup, I would have loved as Joe said, maybe a bit more intensity and like scariness of Jessup, but just being on his base and seeing them running the course along the fence line or just the way he moves through his office. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You got who this guy was and you understood his realm that he was playing in on this remote base on this island where, as they say, don't wear your whites along the fence line because Cubans will shoot at you. It's like, you know, you get the wall You because uh, they talk, they keep talking about the wall that people have to stand on to defend the wall. Right, the meta, like like a literal and metaphoric wall of this piece, and the fact that we actually got to go to the base and see it and understand it, it's like okay, getting the picture. Aaron Sorkin knew where to go and where not to go with like expanding and, and like and like contracting things. Like he knew where to go big and where to kind of keep it to what the original version that he had was. And I mean, as Jill even said, the choice of giving Joanne Galloway an office that they have to go to is such a smart adaptation choice because you could easily translate it the way they do it on stage. But if you can actually build another set, why wouldn't you? Like, like obviously you got the budget to go for it. Go for it. Just redress Jessup's set and make it Joanne Galloway's. I guarantee you that's probably what they did. They probably just did some set redressing and, you know, threw up to different colored walls and things like that. And you kind of can keep repurposing the same rooms. So it's kind of easy to do it that way and just taking advantage of building out these worlds that all these characters are coming from. The fact that we get to walk a street where, what's his name? Sam's walking his child. The little detail like that, of you don't see the baby, right? You never get to see his baby. No, you just hear about her. They you have hear the about conversation, her. conversation, yeah. I think, inside Sam's house as opposed to with the yeah. stroller on the side. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, George, exactly. please correct us. It's much fresher yeah. in your head. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like, once again, yeah. just taking those little moments and Explaining where you can and then knowing when to mm. keep it tight and not gratuit- gratuitously expand something for the sake of, we got the budget, we got the space, let's just go big for the sake of going big. It's like, no, Rob Reiner and Aaron yeah. Sorkin knew how to, like, like where to go, like, where to go, like, where to go big and where to, like, hold the cards. So I thought that was a really good adaptation. And I think, once again, the film's just going to be first on my brain at all times, unfortunately. So it's going to be one of those things where, I'm always going to favor the film over the play, not because I don't like the play, but I do. But it's just the film is so my 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 starting point that it's hard not to, you know, like I, I got George said the markets and the, like the way that falls out in the play versus on stage. I was like, wait a minute, hold on, this isn't the way they do it on film. No. Mm-hmm. So very mm-hmm. different, but at the same time, I get it. On stage, you can't do it the same way, but on film, you can play it a bit more, get the intensity more, you get a bit more of that. Old President's Men, Deep Throat, shows up in the back of the car in shadow. You know, you, you get that intensity, that type of thing there. So, yeah. Ryan, as our lead adaptation man, 
Will this end up on your adaptation so You keep phrasing it that way. I'm not a film scholar. I don't know why you think No, but you do play adaptation. I, do, like, I know, but that yeah. I do plays based on other works, not whatever. <laughs> anyway, just, uh, just um, take the metal. Take the metal. Ryan. Um, so <laughs> take the bad, Ryan. Yeah. I think you've all raised such like amazing points already, and I unfortunately have much more to add. That okay. I think Aaron Sorkin as a playwright is just interesting because he clearly loves the theater like so much. Mm -hmm. You see, like, like I lost count watching the newsroom, how many times he mentioned a play in just like the characters, like bring Mm -hmm. up uh, some Broadway musical at some point. I'm like, okay, wow. All of these characters just love musical theater, I guess. Um, He studied musical theater. (laughs) I'm sure he did. Like, and you know, there's a musicality to his dialogue. It makes sense that he kind of favors this thing. But I look at something like this that started as a play and then became a movie and the movie becoming this like iconic thing. And I feel like this is a movie that feels like a play, but it's also a play that was very Mm -hmm. clearly always destined to be a movie. And Mm -hmm. I think there's an interesting contradiction there is that, you know, it feels like so, you know, static spaces, lots of talking, dialogue heavy. Like, Mm -hmm. of course, this would work in the theater, but I think... It was very, I think he wrote this play knowing that if this is a success, it's going to get, somebody's going to scoop up the film rights and that's where I really want to see it. And like, it's funny because I think we look at like, you know, the the Sorkin writing trademarks, like the very iconic walk and talk, you know, that is in all of his film and TV projects. That's not something you can do on stage. Characters will just talk in the, but you don't really have long corridors for them to walk around unless you do something creative with like a screen that makes it like kind of look like they're walking when they march on in space. But I think he, as much as he clearly loves the theater and obviously keeps coming back to it with things like To Kill a Mockingbird and Camelot and whatever else he has cooking, I think his work works best in a screen medium, whether that's film or television. I just think. And, you know, this moment in the 90s where you could make a movie like this where it's just adults yelling at each other in a courtroom, like, I think it would be hard to sell this screenplay or to Hollywood today, even if it was successful on stage. Like, also, they don't really write plays like this anymore. But, like, you know, the climate of Hollywood is very different, that this is a very 90s adult drama that you just don't really see anymore. That, yeah, I think it was kind of, he had to know that this would eventually be a film. And to that point, to get now into the adaptation, I do think I see his writing of the screenplay as him taking the version that he made to fit the stage and writing the version that I think he always wanted. And Mm. like... And some of that includes like great, like brilliant things like we've already discussed about the the whole Markinson that, yeah, you can really get him in the scene, have him like lurking in the back of the car and really amp the tension up in that stuff. But then you also get some, I don't know, stupider things like Luther. I just think the whole, the two scenes with Luther are just so dumb. I'm sorry, Jill, you just complimented them. I think they're great. It's to show that he's to, more than just like a naval it's officer. to show he's that he has one black fine. friend. Uh, that's the only reason it's there. <laughs> and now, to be fair, I think the necessity of that scene makes would actually make more sense in the play where he physically assaults Dawson which I think is very in- smartly cut out of the movie. The, did they still do that, George? That's still in there for some reason? And I think, yeah. And I, 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 I really thought that was a really important part in the play because oh, really? it showed the relationship between the two of them. And then also they have a moment before one of the courtroom scenes in Act 2 <laughs> where they kind of talk about that moment again. So mm-hmm. I thought that, I, I thought, it was weird because like that moment was meant for the punch to happen so that he could get into that angry uh, moment. But at the same time, I don't know. It's it, it worked in the movie too. And I think that I understand why they didn't do it. I understand yeah. why. Like, yeah. I, I, I can hear what you're saying and agree with like why it adds something to the dynamic, but I also think there's enough drama there that it's not necessary. And I think yeah, yeah I, I give kudos to the film for making that cut, even if it would still work with it. And I'm sure the stage version still does as well. The one yeah. thing that I think is actually a very good cut uh, that the film made is we don't need the scene of Jessup coercing the doctor into forging the documents that I think that that is in the play. It's not in the movie. And 
it actually raises the stakes that we're pretty sure we know what happened, but we don't get to actually be shown that this is something there that recontextualizes when we see the doctor right. on the stand. So yeah, there's definitely things I like in the change, but at the end of the day, these aren't necessarily media specific things. Anything that I've talked about here, maybe the Luther thing is because it's like, well, yeah, we can, but you could have easily set up a newsstand on the stage. I have a question with that. Sure. Do we, because I'm not remembering, and the scenes are quite quick when he does mm-hmm. buy the magazine from Luther. Mm-hmm. Uh, does anyone remember like what magazine he purchases? It's a is baseball, it a news sports magazine? magazine. It's a baseball sports magazine. Okay, never mind. Because he I thought loves if it was like <laughs> if it was like a news one or something, I'm like, okay, that also adds like a subtle layer of like, here's this guy that doesn't seem like he's on top of his shit mm-hmm. or like know what he's talking about, but like, mm-hmm. but by him, I don't know, keeping up with things in the '90s, like you can't scroll through your, <laughs> you know, like the all these different platforms, mm-hmm. like right. you. Yeah, you gotta you keep to go up to with the stand. times or go to the newsstand and yeah but the fact that yeah. it's it's a sports thing okay and like clearly jessup's promotion is highly publicized in the news and he didn't know anything about that so he's not right. like he is signified as somebody who doesn't keep up with the, you know <laughs> at least the, the military news i don't know why you know somebody being appointed to this not even a cabinet position is making big mm-hmm. news but apparently that's like a big thing but yeah i, I don't know I, I just think the the luther scenes to me like it's not even interesting dialogue. They're just like, you know, barking idioms at each other. And like, I get it's supposed to humanize him and it creates a space for him to be for the scene when they get back in his car and then see Markinson spook him. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I just, it, to me, it, it just seems transparently like, look, he has a black friend. Isn't he so, you know, woke and relatable? Mm-hmm. <laughs> even though this is like clearly not a friend. This is somebody he... Yeah does transactions with every so often and has a rapport with i don't know <laughs> like it, it's a silly thing to have gripes with but that i don't know i it's something that i don't i think dramaturgically if there was a scene of that written for the play it was wisely mm-hmm. cut and maybe he really wanted to get it back in the movie or he wrote it for the movie because he felt like he had the canvas for it i don't know mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah uh, i'll also ryan i do agree with you on jessup and like cutting that scene mm-hmm. because i feel like in the stage production when they add that it kind of ruins the ending in a way because it's like you know already what's going to happen and it's just a matter of like how they get there but at the same time it's it it adds an element of surprise a little more by cutting that scene all together and just continuing with the storyline i feel like Mm -hmm. it's a really smart idea for the film adaptation Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so please joe go ahead go go ahead go ahead ryan like, I'm honestly surprised that Sorkin didn't rewrite the stage play after the movie came out to be like mm. the things that he changed can, you know, when you are producing this regional theaters, by all means, do it mm-hmm. more like the movie way because I like it more than the original mm-hmm. play. I'm surprised that we are still using the 1989 yep. stage version as this, especially since everybody coming to this in the audience probably has seen the movie and is. Yeah, right. But then there is still that excitement of, oh, this is the original. OK, I've never read this before. I didn't see it back in the day let's now make a Mm. comparison you could just stay at home and watch the movie if you want to see exactly the movie Mm -hmm. sorry joe go ahead it's okay i was just specifically yeah talking Mm -hmm. about dr stone that whole scene i I think it it kind of screams like spoon feeding the audience like remember that jessup is a bad man Mm -hmm. and it's like okay well the text I, I get that we just saw him in the beginning and then we just see him at the end. But like, it's kind of, I, I want to be like, Sorkin, trust your text. Like the text already sets up, like we know this person is like a force. Mm-hmm. And I found like that scene to just kind of, it kind of like was like dead space. Like it was kind of taking yeah. away from the trajectory that the piece at whole was already going through. And then you like just insert the scene. It kind of just seemed to be like, I'm, I'm bringing Jess up back to your radar because you're about to see this character again. And I'm like, okay, I, I didn't really need that, you know? Yeah. And we already like, know that out from the draft. We, and we already know that Jessup's a liar because he tells them that, yes, and that's why I recommended Santiago should be transferred, which the movie really like puts a, a microscope on that by then cutting to Markinson's eyes, which obviously you can't do uh, like in the stage version, but <laughs> the audience can pick up that like, okay, this guy's a liar. We get it. Get him on the stand so he can tell us that the truth doesn't matter. And so, yeah, yeah agreed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's get into our second last question. We're almost to the end, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, I'm after this may bleed over from our previous question, which is 
a lot has changed in the world uh, since A Few Good Men first premiered on Broadway in 1989. Would you say the piece has aged well? Are there themes that strike you as being a bit outdated nowadays that weren't uh, when the play first got released? Does it speak differently to today's so-called post-truth media climate? Jill, I see you making some interesting, thoughtful faces. What's yeah, say I'm to just, you? I just think like a lot of this question, I feel like we've we've kind of unpacked and danced mm-hmm. around through through our other answers. Um, and I think just like to kind of put a mm-hmm. cap on on what I've said already mm-hmm. is, I think both this movie and the play mm-hmm. like should still mm-hmm. be watched and considered in the climate mm-hmm. that we're in right now, because like I had mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. like these systems still very much exist mm-hmm. and versions of sexism and versions mm-hmm. of the patriotism that are different from the nineties mm-hmm. mayhaps, but are still mm-hmm. alive and mm-hmm. infesting and infecting mm-hmm. cases and situations like this. So I think, yeah, like there's like anything that's kind of done in the past and mm-hmm. revered in the past mm-hmm. does have you are kind of looking at it through a different lens nowadays. Yeah. But in pieces like this, like I said, both the play and the screenplay, there's a lot of I love pieces that have kind of like they made such a strong statement of when they were made and then it now allows their like it provides fodder for like looking at a piece like that today and picking out like okay that's wrong but why is that wrong and like it was wrong back then but like oh and it's also wrong now but for different reasons like mm-hmm. it's a thinker right it's like so mm-hmm. i think and there's something interesting about knowing that we just talked about this, the only kind of like media when this play was done and when this movie was out, like we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have Fox didn't News. Have, Fox News Fox didn't News, come out. We yet. didn't have like high tech, high mm-hmm. Intel devices or technology. Like, like maybe like, right. We didn't necessarily have uh, um, video cameras or like digitized, like AI mm-hmm. way of operating the marines right like they're referring to the marine handbooks like now obviously all of that is encased in a computer and like you know and so it's interesting Mm -hmm. that these themes still exist today and the humanity of the piece still exists Mm -hmm. today and it's actually Mm -hmm. kind of like spooky to know that still exists alongside all of the Mm -hmm. media and technology advancements Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, just thinking about that is mm-hmm. very scary. Yeah, I I feel like I kind of answered that question, but knowing that we've kind of unpacked it throughout the whole conversation, I wanted to just pop that in there of like mm-hmm. that oh. this still res mm-hmm. resonates, but on adding on top of it, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. we've advanced so much mm-hmm. in one way and mm-hmm. absolutely not in mm-hmm. in another, right? Yeah. So I'll piggyback on to- on top of you, Jill on this one just because i think you hit a lot of points that i was going to agree with you on is that yes this play is still very much i mean it's aged well unfortunately in the sense that the cringiness of the sexism and the old boys club that we see play out in this play is not that like it's like as i said the stat at the beginning 27 percent of the military is female 72 percent is male like the fact that still thing, the fact that only in the last like five, 10 years are we now getting like all these reports of, I think this is the first time Biden just said one of his nominees, well, it was like the first time a female was going to be like head of the Navy or something where it's like the fact that it's now what, 2023 and we're still getting the first women in certain roles of like high command. It's like, seriously, like it's taken us this long and women have been very capable and have been very yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I played parts in the military throughout its history doing things like that, but I've never been given the chance to move through. And the fact you have a character like Galloway, who, I mean, I mean, one of the ones that made me chuckle so uncomfortably was there's that first scene where she's asking for 
the assignment of this case and they do the, you need to leave. And she does the, no, I'm okay here. And they go, no, you need to leave. So we go, I'll talk behind your back. It's like, that stuff still happens today. Like that's not some foregone ye old day way this works. You know, like it's one of those things. And even like the toxic patriotism that goes on in this world, mm -hmm. particularly down in the States where this is very much a topic nowadays. Yeah. Like, this is still very much a piece that ties in with all that as well. And just like Downey in particular with this whole thing of what do we do wrong? Like you get him right away where like Gala keeps setting up like, I, I, he's not fast mentally. Like he follows the rules, take the question slow, get him on off the scene as quick as possible because the military get like the way it's set up in the States and here, I believe, I don't, I don't know, I don't know the full extent of the military, but basically it's like, if you can't afford to go to a post-secondary institution, join the military, you get a free ride with education and you get a good pension in by like 40 or 50 years old. Like it's one of those things where like, there's a, like it, uh, that plays on certain economic classes and Downey, you know, falls into that. And it's one of those things where this place still has a lot to say about the military. I mean, I was just reading up this today, like uh, uh, on my way back to the city, is back in 2017, or sorry, 2016, they announced plans to do this as a live TV play, basically, kind of in line with like with Jesus Christ Superstar, Sound and Music with Carrie Underwood. Mm. This was going to be one of them starring Alec Baldwin as Colonel Jessup. And unfortunately, oh. it's being delayed because Aaron Sorkin got busy with Molly's game and things like that. And then and the, and one of the lead producers passed away. Mm -hmm. But, like, this is still something they're looking at doing today, and they wanted Earth working to work his script again. Like, tweak it a bit more, make it a bit more modern, you know, like, maybe tone down some of the lines we can't say anymore, you know, stuff like that there, where, like, this place still wanting to be revisited and talked about. And I mean, I wouldn't put it past some Broadway producer to go, let's revive this and put it on Broadway again. It's cheap to mount because, you know, the set's not all that elaborate. The costumes are pretty straightforward. We get a big name to play Colonel Jessup. And, you know, away we go. It's like easy to get on, easy to say. And I, and I mean, once again, the military's big down in the States. And this plays, like, you know, it's part of their culture more than anything else. Like it, it's a major part of their built in culture is the military. So I think this still has a lot to say today about the, as I said, the toxic patriotism that drives this piece that makes it so these men are willing to follow a rule that ultimately gets somebody killed unintentionally according to them so you know it's one of those things where yeah i i think there's still stuff there even if you know some of the, the language is a bit dated and yes we would like a more updated script to help with that but overall i think the story is still very timeless i mean once again we had what was the one in the middle east the prisoner prison abu Ghraib, right where like we had like all the pictures come out of abu Ghraib and the way they were treating the prisoners there and all the trials that came out from that like all that stuff post 9-11, it's so there in this play, even though this play came back, it was out in the 80s and 90s. Like, there's so much more you can play with here now that I love to see Aaron Zorkin take a tinkering to the script and get it brought back for a new audience because there's something here really good that can be mm -hmm. worked and revisited. George, what say with you? Uh, yeah, no, I completely agree with you on that. I think that... There is always like a time and a place to revisit like an old work. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, a lot of the time history will, will repeat itself if people don't learn mm -hmm. from past mistakes, past things that happen. Like the fact that a lot of Americans don't even know what the Holocaust is really terrifying and how like that stuff that they have kind of erased mm -hmm. from teaching people. And I mm -hmm. think that it's an important lesson to be to be learned. Right. But like things like. For example, A Few Good Men, it, it teaches, mm -hmm. like, how toxic, like, mm -hmm. yeah, the military can do some good things, but also it's a very toxic environment mm -hmm. for a lot of people, especially if you are an underdog. Like, Santiago, for example, just mm -hmm. happened to not be that great, but he was, he was tortured because he was not great. Mm -hmm. And, like, that's, like, that's what's really sad about it is because he didn't do anything wrong, per se. He just... He couldn't, he had health conditions. He had things that were a problem that they kind of ignored and tried to make him into the military 
personnel that they wanted to make him into. And that's a really toxic thing, right? So I think that like there's definitely a lot of things because for example, like in in spoiler alert, but in the Barbie movie, there is a yeah, yeah there's a line about the patriarchy as a whole yeah. and how uh he's like, Well, you're not doing patriarchy well. He's like, Oh, we're just very good at hiding it now. And that's a very <laughs> that's a very good line to have because it's, it's like line. people because people are scared to be this bigot that they mm -hmm. are and be called out for it, but it still happens. It's mm -hmm. still built in into our system. It's still a thing that it, it, it's happening mm -hmm. all the time. And it's good to talk about it and to learn from it so that we can move forward mm -hmm. as a society as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think that there is a lot of good in it, even with the, the cringy parts of the film. I think that it's a really good learning post for Western civilization as a mm -hmm. whole. Right. I was just about to say, George, I feel like every man in this like script and screenplay, including Jessup, deserves a big healthy spoonful of you are Knuff. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Mm. Because like I think that a lot of them have like there's a lot of toxic masculinity and a lot mm -hmm. of things that they touch on that is still very prevalent mm -hmm. in our society as a whole and how people are mm -hmm. online nowadays, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's still, people are just better at hiding it now because they can hide behind a mm -hmm. computer screen and they don't have to mm -hmm. uh, talk to a person face to face. But it, mm -hmm. there are still people that use those words. There are people that mm -hmm. still are very uh, demeaning to women. There are people that are still very, mm -hmm. they, they're just very crude in the way they talk. Mm -hmm. And it's still a big mm -hmm. problem in our society, especially in the U.S. and in Canada mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. with everything going on. So it's, yeah, I agree. I think that there's still a lot mm -hmm. there. I think also, sorry, just to add, I love that we're like opening this Barbie alongside a few good men portal. Cause I think I know. It's, it's, it's lovely. Ryan and I literally saw Barbie just before we're doing this panel too. So it I is saw it on Saturday fresh night. In the noggin. <laughs> yeah. But like, it's interesting too, like uh, every, again, we see this more so in the movie than the, than the play, but like mm -hmm. every man in this mm -hmm. show, in this mm -hmm. film, every character comes face to face with fear. Like, it, and, but doesn't necessarily, doesn't address their fear, doesn't address maybe why they're scared. But like, even like, look at like Ross is, doesn't want to lose to Kathy or I'm like, Kathy doesn't, is scared of maybe ex my expectations are not going to like, I'm not going to win. Mm -hmm. I'm scared of losing. Jessup is scared to back down and tell the truth. Like Downey is scared. You can't handle the lost. truth. You know, Dawson is scared because he knows what he did was wrong, but he, and he also like, there's like this idea of like being scared and being fearful, but not knowing how to discuss that, not knowing how to open up about that. And is that's literally the unfortunate, I talk about this a lot in conversations, like our men in today's day and age, I feel bad for them, especially like people like our parents' generation, or just like they have been ingrained in their heads that they are the breadwinner. They cannot show emotion. They have to keep trudging forward. They can't whatever. And they've never been given the opportunity or the openness to express and the only way they know how to do that is through argument or through violence, you know, and it's like, we need to change those narratives and like having a piece like this still obviously res resonates because I think there's also so much you can do with that. It's like these fearful men and they don't even, their vocabulary is stunted because patriarchy and society have not allowed them to, yeah, to be themselves, to find out who they are without Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> there's a match Ryan, that nobody ever saw coming a few good men. i know right ryan, ryan you want to yeah. add to this step, this step cocktail? aside oppenheimer a few the, good men this, is the double bill we should cocktail? Yeah. <laughs> um yeah i don't know so much stuff has been brought up um in terms of just talking about general like datedness and the way the world has changed since this came out it's really interesting that the play came out in 1989 which is quite famously the year that the cold war ended now mm -hmm. i don't know timeline wise when this premiere before or after the wall came down a very different wall than the one that they're always talking about in this but obviously he was writing it before the end of that but certainly the movie mm -hmm. in 1992 they mentioned peacetime a lot jill as per your your choice of beverage more so than i think they do in the mm -hmm. play and 
the 90s very much was between the end of the Cold War and 9-11 and the War on Terror, this, you know, what Francis Fukuyama called the end of history, that liberal democracy seems to have won this worldwide game of chess and, you know, there's no, you know, nothing that will ever depose it as a, a form of philosophical progress that'll work for structuring society. Like, I, I think... It's funny thinking about things like Guantanamo Bay that, you know, I remember my parents telling me that when they saw this movie in theaters in 1992, they had never even heard of the fact that there was this American naval base in Cuba, that that was news to them. And now we all know about this a lot because in the war on terror, it became very topical and in the headlines. And like, I wonder just like, I don't know if there is a way to update this story because it feels very much like it belongs in that milieu, like this it, and in a way, like, it's interesting because Jessup's whole argument that we'll talk about more in the next and final question is that, like, if my men don't follow orders, you know, people will die. And if you wear your whites close to this wall, you're going to get shot. And, like, they're acting like there's these hostile tensions that really were not hostile in the moment that this was taking place. Like, this was peacetime. Cuba wasn't technically the enemy on paper in the 90s. Like... And yeah, like it's, it feels like trying to transplant this into a post 9-11 world war on terror context. It's a lot more than just a fresh coat of paint. There's a lot of things you would have to completely rethink in that new context. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the answers to that are. I'm sure somebody could do it, but I, I almost feel like we, you know, this is a famously a 90s movie that doing any production of it that's set in the period is going to you know, ring differently when you're like, all oh, right, this is a moment in history versus, ooh, what does this have to say to us now? Like, and to, I guess because the question specifically addresses mm -hmm. the post-truth media climate as something that has radically changed here. I, like, there's very little partisanship present in the plot of this, mm -hmm. that it's at the end of the day, everybody comes together that we want to know the truth. And we think, you know, that, you know, even like, Kevin Bacon is technically the antagonist here in terms of like the actual battle of wits that takes on most of the plot that can he convince the jury that this was murder and can Cappy mm -hmm. alternatively convince them that there was no intent because they were just following orders. And like the second that Ross, Kevin Bacon, whatever we want to call him, the second that he finds out that, oh no, I was wrong. He's very quick to be like, well, I stand for the truth. And <laughs> even though I'm completely mm. fucked now <laughs> that my side mm. is completely lost and my, who knows what's going to become of my career. You know, you have the right to remain silent. Someone who very much outranks me because, and it paints this very black and white view of the world that mm -hmm. the bad guys will be easily coerced mm -hmm. into stating their villainy in front of everyone because at the end of the day, they don't think they did anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And like, it's, it's kind of adorable, like how naive a view of morality and villainy and the terrible things that people get away with here. That like, again, like to bring it back to that line from the Barbie movies, they're better at hiding it now. <laughs> in like a way that and I don't know Sorkin's writing is always described as being very aspirational in this way in terms of politics and morality the entire premise of the West Wing is mm -hmm. what if Bill Clinton but no sex scandal like could we just have that please during these turbulent Bush years mm -hmm. and you know it's nice but I just don't know if it's believable I don't know if it was even believable then but it at least kind of fits the general culture of the time but maybe part of my ambivalence watching this today is that like, that's cute that you think that we can end with this big shouting match that will get the bad guys to admit that they're bad. But like, I don't know, it just doesn't really seem like it fits or that it's believable as entertaining as it might be. Fair. Fair, fair. All right. Let's dive in. Final question of the night. In the climactic scene, Colonel Jessup argues that matters of national security should be given the right to supersede the rule of law. Got to stand the post, man the wall. What are your thoughts about the philosophical debate raised in this argument? Ryan, since you went last time, we'll let you kick this one off. Well, like, oh, do I agree with the villain? No, I know I don't. Shocking, I know. No, like, yes. I don't know. There's interesting things that we could unpack about this. You know, even if we just take the peacetime context that I just brought up, the fact that 
you know, he stands his ground so firmly in that if I, if my men don't follow their orders and if we don't have a well-trained, you know, force watching this wall, people will die. And like, okay, historically, that doesn't even seem to have been the case in this context. But even if we put that aside, it's, you know, I guess to quote Winston Churchill when, you know, they talked about uh, cutting arts funding to support the World War II effort. He said, well, what are we fighting for? So what good is preserving the nation if that nation is not going to hold itself to civic democracy, I guess, is why I don't think that his argument really holds up that I should be allowed to do whatever I want, laws be damned, because I know what's in the best interest of the nation. Obviously, we have these checks and balances that are supposed to hold people accountable. It's to take another play turn movie about American history. It's like Frost Nixon, for example. Mm. If the president done it, does it, then it's not illegal. Like, okay, but the president has to be accountable just like everybody else does. A high-ranking colonel needs to be accountable to the law just as everybody else does. That said, the rule of law is not always uh, a helpful metric of what is morally permissible, as I think we've seen a lot lately in terms of the way that police can inflict violence upon people of color with pretty much impunity, as we've seen a lot of uh, within these past few years, but also throughout pretty much all of American history. And maybe unjust laws need to change, but what we are presented here is a very kind of clear-cut situation. And and again, I guess this, I'm going on some tangents here, but to just bring it to the core of the question, I, I, I think the law that is being, you know, discussed here is very much a situation where there are easy answers that you really, you know, shouldn't have led to the death of this person. You shouldn't have lied about it and doctored documents. So of course you are in the wrong here. And yeah, and yeah, I guess going back to what I've been saying since the beginning here is I find it's very easy to Mm -hmm. agree with the the good guys side of this Mm -hmm. because I don't feel like the, the plot structures much of a moral argument and it it knows what the right thing is and it's Mm -hmm. not really interested in the morality of it it's interesting in can the good guys prove the truth i don't know somebody else say something and maybe i'll I'll Uh, chime in yeah no i i completely agree with you on that i think that my my problem with the whole like you know we have to guard post or men will die Mm -hmm. argument is that it's such a north american thing to say because a lot (laughs) of the time they think that they're the villain and everything but a lot of the time, like, there is nobody that's trying to attack them. A lot of the time, Americans are the ones that start things. And it's such a brainwashing way of we have to be, it's the American way. Like, the amount of times that they said that throughout the film and even in the play, it's such a propaganda way of going off of, like, what Western military is like and whatnot, right? So I don't agree with that. And I also think that the whole argument of, like, people who are above everybody being above the law, you see that in so many ways of like how billionaires are treated in, on the planet uh, and the fact that they're above the law 99.9% of the time. Mm-hmm. Or like, for example, even the president, like Donald Trump and the way that he uh-huh. dealt with the election and trying to still over... Is. <laughs> yeah, and still is trying to overturn the election when it already happened. And it was like, and it was a thing where he kept trying to entice people into thinking that it was like rigged and whatever it's like it's a brainwashing thing i think it's not i think that if we look at the way that north america has been built it's built on things like colonialism and trying to like put our mark on everything and it's like it's such a toxic way of thinking that i don't think that anyone's above the law and i think we also have to look at the laws themselves and what we can do to change that too to make it better for everyone because there's a lot of people that don't benefit from the justice system as a whole and it's a very corrupt system even the military in my opinion military industrial complex it's a thing yeah 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 joe yeah just kind of piggybacking off of what's mm-hmm. all been said already and just to kind of bring even more to the forefront like Uh, It's super spooky what people of power think they have and don't have. And if they don't have it, the lengths they'll go to get it or to keep it. And it's really interesting with this 
character, like thinking about all that through this character of Colonel Jessup and that beautiful, I honestly want to say heartbreaking monologue that he gives once the you can't handle the truth cracks him mm-hmm. open a bit. Because again, you can see this, yeah, this like power hungry monster, but mapping out truths and mm-hmm. this, the amount of damage mm-hmm. that he has gone through or the amount of shit that he's had to see or has mm-hmm. had to deal with. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say I feel bad for the character, but it's like, it's a testament to how mm-hmm. corrupt our systems are and how, mm-hmm. like George was saying, like we need to relook at the system. We need to relook mm-hmm. at the law because the fact mm-hmm. that the only way to deal mm-hmm. with this uh, underdog Santiago mm-hmm. is through corruption and through mm-hmm. something that isn't even written in a law book. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that you have to go to the extent of shooting a random um citizen in the back because you think they're reaching for their pocket probably just to grab mm-hmm. a piece of gum is again it's this this mm-hmm. idea like this scared fear corruption that is like mm-hmm. stimulating these choices mm-hmm. that just yeah people just throw everything out mm-hmm. the window because mm-hmm. The laws themselves, the system themselves, aren't mapped out in a way that everyone is included or everyone's opinions are acknowledged. Like, mm-hmm. it sounds so you u- utopic to even think of when that day is going to come, mm-hmm. when like everybody can fall under the umbrella of the law and feel mm-hmm. seen and heard, and especially when you have something like in this question of like in which Colonel Jessup, yeah, argues the matters of national security should be given the right to supersede the rule of the law. It's like, these are the people that are supposed to be like protecting a nation. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can't even protect properly one person. Mm -hmm. And that's not, it's not people like Colonel Jessup's fault. That's like a long entrenched history of combustion and corruption Mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed. So I absolutely like, do not agree because at the end of the day like again i have not been i have not been in the marines i have not been in you know the what? side the shoes of, of these characters but like it's so violence is never the answer and it's like i i have the clear mind of thinking like there's other ways of going mm-hmm. about things but like mm-hmm. Again, I've never been in the shoes mm-hmm. or in the minds of people who have mm-hmm. suffered mm-hmm. the gaping wounds mm-hmm. of society and mm-hmm. law at, at a scale like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like that was just a little bit of thought soup. Uh, Mac, you want to <laughs> dip your cracker in that or? Sure. I'll, I'll take us out here. Oh, I completely agree with Jessup. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd mean, be hard pressed to find someone in this room. Who would I'd be like, Mac, That's... you can't handle the truth. That is false. You don't agree with Anna. <laughs> but also, like, even if you have the kernel of inclination to agree with, like, you know, national security is very important, and I could understand sometimes things need to mm-hmm. fudge. Like, this movie is a refutation against that argument. Mm-hmm. So, like, and it's, yeah. you know, very, you know, clear in that position mm-hmm. that it'd be hard to watch this yeah. movie and then leave. But, you know, that monologue is pretty compelling and he makes a good point and, you know, fuck Willie Santiago. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you know, okay. sorry, Mac, of continue so. agreeing with him. <laughs> so, so yeah, no, I mean, like, once again, national, like, national security is a thing that, you know, we do need to be vigilant about, but not at the st- sake of people like William Santiago, who, you know, bought into a system because, you know, the country kind of built the system up that you want to join it, you know, because it gives you the free ride of education, good pension, blah, 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 all that stuff. And I mean, the tragedy of Santiago is he goes to everybody and says, I want out. They ignore him. And Jessup gets angry when, you know, Santiago gets frustrated with, I keep saying, let me out. You guys don't let me out. So I got to go around you to, you know, make something happen. Um, so like, that's the problem is you need to keep the humanity involved in national security because yes, human lives are at stake. I mean, we now know very well that they, like, uh, you know, the U.S. was tracking Al-Qaeda before 9-11, but, you know, they didn't see it in the way it should have done because the systems weren't in place, blah, blah, blah. And they didn't, you know, 
follow up and ultimately people died unfortunately and they you and then the military used that to you know gin up another war that they could then go in and do their thing because that's you know look at it like looking at history americans are very good at ginning up villains and wars to go stand the wall against because it keeps them going economically so yeah no like it's one of those things where like no national security should never supersede the law follow the law and keep us safe like it's not it shouldn't be all cloaks and daggers and all that type of stuff. Like if Santiago says, get me off this base because I'm not working here, get him off the base. Jessup, mm-hmm. like that's the easy answer to your problem is it, if you know Santiago is not a good Marine in this situation and you're worried about protecting the wall, get the guy off the wall because he's asking for a transfer out off the wall. But he's also looking at protecting his own ego and status. And if he were mm-hmm. to let a Marine go, yeah. then that is someone that he yeah. failed to train. True. True. Yeah. True. So once Because again, that's it, the yeah. crux of the problem. It is. It is. It is. Personal it's not about national ego. security. It's about yeah. his time. Ego place. and failure. Yeah. It, it, well, mm-hmm. no, it's, it's just, yeah. it's the men in yeah. North American society, especially, mm-hmm. have never been given permission to fail. Mm-hmm. Like, have never been given permission to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Have never been given permission to... Yeah, to be a raw human, they have mm-hmm. to abide by rules or be a mm-hmm. certain figure or factor in society. Mm-hmm. And then, like, yeah, like, anyways, yeah, go go back yeah. to it, Mac. But that's- yeah, so I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like, the the film doesn't really give a Jessup side of the argument. I mean, it's kind of set up where you're not really debating it because it's like, no, when like like William Santiago should not have died. The code red should not have been ordered because it because it was already outlawed. Jessup, because he was living on his own little island out there on Cuba, just said, "I'm going to do it my way," and you know, consequences happen. So it's one of those things where, yeah, Ryan's right or George, I'm going to say it where it's like the moral argument really isn't there because the other side isn't given the teeth to actually give a fair argument. It's given one monologue at the end, and he's very quickly carted off. After after he's like, already confessed to the crime, yes. so he's yeah. cr- destroyed his own credibility. <laughs> exactly. Right when he makes that monologue. Exactly. So it's one of those things where, you know, like yeah, I mean, like as I said, like no, the law never gets you know second tier to national security. The law is first. We all are taught from day one of our lives there are laws, there are rules to playing in in the world and in the sandbox and in daycare and in school and in the workplace. There are rules and there are things in place that we all have to follow. And, you know, it's plain and simple. And, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where, no, just because you believe there is a problem doesn't mean you get to, you know, do what you want to do and, you know, tap into our cell phones or, mm-hmm. you know, throw somebody in Guantanamo and keep them there because they're the number three person in al-qaeda and if we let them out they're gonna you know take the revenge on, on america because of the way they were treated in guantanamo it's a whole thing that actually is a really good documentary all about the whole what's what's the word they use not torture but it's like extreme interrogation techniques where they talk about the guys who created it actually had no real clue about what they were doing and actually never experienced they, they, they were guys who you know did psychological evaluations and went well you can push the person to here and it's okay, according to our research, where it's like, yeah, like it's, like it's like, no, you don't get to play cloak and daggers. Just follow the law and play the system. And, you know, if you actually do your job, you won't have these problems where you got to go around the law. Just, yes, Joe. I think just to add to that, too, I think there, there's, this is with everything in society. It's not just like attributed to the characters we're talking about right now, but like, I'm still always shocked and like, as I grow into being an adult, how misinformed and miscommunication, like miscommunication and misinformation is present in day-to-day life and Mm -hmm. in working facilities. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think it's, that's another kind of thing to unpack in this Mm -hmm. show is like, Kathy has never, he actually says the line of like, there's a reason why someone of like my caliber is brought to this case right mm-hmm. because they're probably wanting me to lose because i don't have any idea what i'm doing and then you have like downy being like he doesn't even understand and know 
half of the terms that's going on in that Mm -hmm. courtroom. Yet he is being trained to be a Marine and be of the same caliber as everyone else. Like there's a lot of like in society, I think everyone's like, okay, go, go. You're ready. You're ready. And I'm like, I'm, I've always been the kid. And George has been in classes with me too, where like I raise my hand and ask questions And I would like to know what an answer is or what I'm doing, because it's like, Mm -hmm. I want to be able to be the best that I can be. And I want to be able to play in Mm -hmm. the same ring as everyone and be a good follower and be Mm -hmm. a good leader. So I need to be trained or I need to be taught a certain way so that I can reach my potential and reach the potential of everyone else. Mm -hmm. And like, I can't tell you how many different circles. I'm not just talking about the art industry. I'm talking about like Joe Jobs. I'm talking about like in family relationships, like us humans, we just like throw people out to passion or like figure it out. And then when stuff crumbles or doesn't go the right way, then people blow up and it's like, okay, well, no, we need to communicate more, you know? And yeah, otherwise like mistakes are made and like people's lives are at stake. That's like a whole existential Pebble, I Thing. just dropped the <laughs> and, and maybe but don't it's confuse true. tying someone up and shaving their head with training them. Yeah. Give them actual No, exactly. Training. Yeah, yeah. But again, like uh, someone like Downey and Dawson, like if mm. they're coming from, they don't know how, like even if something as like grotesque as a code red, like were they explained properly? Like what a code red, even though it's immorally corrupt it's, and it's wrong. It's not in the handbook. It's not in the handbook. So once again, it's like, figure it out. And it's like, okay, well, that could have gone a lot worse, but it did. Like he literally Mm -hmm. died, but like, that's so scary. It's like there, you're literally going in blind Mm -hmm. on something that's not even legal, you Mm -hmm. know, like it's, yeah. I also just love how Kiefer Sutherland did not learn his lesson from this movie because the entire plot of 24 is him breaking the law because he believes national security is at stake. That is every single episode of that show. That is all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And on that note, let's yes. wrap it up, shall we? Because yeah. we can keep going on these moral debates and diving into American military systems and all that good stuff. But let's wrap it out here for the day, shall we? All mm-hmm. right, George, as our newest panelist, we'll let you give your sign off first. Go ahead. Where can people find uh, follow you? Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram, George Alavisos underscore. So my full name underscore. And you can find me on Twitter, same username also, or it's called X now, not even Twitter. But anyway, you can find me on Facebook and you and I have a show coming out. I'm in the new Ooh. boy spinoff. I'm on Gen V, cool. which is coming off on and coming out on September 29th on Amazon Ooh. Prime. I'm in the first episode, which I'm really looking forward to. And then, yeah, just still doing my council work for ACTRA, which is the film and TV union, and for Equity, which is the live theater union. And I'm looking forward to working more and talking to you guys more in future conversations. So thank Wonderful. you for having me. Yeah. Wonderful. Jill, when can we find you on a Law & Order or a Murdoch Mysteries episode? Mac, you're telling me. I would love <laughs> either of those things. If anyone's listening or watching... Hire me. No, uh, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram at jillian.robinson96. As I mentioned earlier, I am back into doing Pinpin the Explorer, which is a shadow and live puppet show Mm -hmm. happening at Red Sand Castle Theater. We just did our first weekend of August shows, and then we're going back to Red Sand Castle the last week of August. The audience is like primarily for babies and toddlers, but like, parents and anyone is welcome to come to like everyone leaves the show it's a good feeling show. good my castmate jonah villa she plays pin pin the titular penguin and i play all mm. the other animal friends so i am an ostrich a crocodile a turtle a worm a, a parrot. parrot and i got everyone right ryan yeah, yeah, and myself. We have some interactive, yeah. anyways. And a boat. <laughs> and a boat. Yeah, so it's super fun. We're also remounting again in October. And then in in between that, like, I, I'm i looking forward to, yeah, auditioning more, getting my feet wet more with film and TV. Hopefully my short film I did in March will come out. But Woo. stay tuned to my artist account and keep up with all things there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ryan, give us a classic Ryan Barakovich send-off. Uh, no need. 
trying to find or follow me. I don't do much on social media, but if you like me and all my theater related opinions, you can just follow Cup of Hemlock. That's where they all live. It's at COH Theater on Facebook, Instagram, and X for some reason. And who knows, by the time this episode goes out, X might not even exist anymore. <laughs> but it? yeah, or you could, you know, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on all the podcast places. Mm-hmm. You've been on the internet. You know how this works. Very good. And you can find, follow me at Mackenzie Horner, all social media platforms. You can follow all my musical antics over at Before the Downbeat, a musical podcast. We are finally releasing season five. And if you're wanting more courtroom drama fun, you can hear our whole episode all about the musical Parade, which has some very, which has a very big courtroom sequence toward the end of act one that is very intense and has lots going on. And we get all into that as well. Other than that, yeah, just keep hanging in there. We got lots of good stuff planned. We got some duet reviews, some interviews, all that good stuff coming your way. And if you have a film adaptation you want to talk about, let us know. Send us a message. Comment on the video. If you want to, you know, get in contact with us because you want us to see your show, go on down into the comments. The link is there too, where you can send us an email and let us know about your upcoming show and we can find a way to get involved with you so there you go all right everybody ten hut signing off adios amigos stand the post on the wall